you have your glass of Florida orange juice this morning? <laughs> separated him from the crowd. The steady stream of citizens gazing momentarily at his lifeless face. There were still hints of the youth, the vigor, the vitality that he had once possessed that made him one of Florida's youngest governors and youngest speaker of the house. His coffin placed beside the main rotunda of the capital near the main stairways that just a handful of years earlier he could be seen hopping along with a characteristic mixture of youth and vitality. But now, as spring was turning into fall, the state was about to bury its governor, stricken down by a heart attack, leaving in the unexpected wake of his death the bricks and mortar that was supposed to be used to build a new progressive era in the state. His successor, the acting governor, Charlie Johns, was also the Senate president and his political nemesis, a highly skilled practitioner of the status quo and corrupt backroom bargaining. Charlie Johns wasted no time in informing friend and foe alike that it would still remain business as usual here in the Sunshine State, that the promise of a Dan McCarty administration would remain just that, mere promise, unfulfilled and discarded by the frustrating habits of happenstance. Just six months earlier, he seemed to be on the verge of moving Florida towards the new emerging image of the New South, placing it reluctantly on the right side of history. His was a new kind of Florida politician. He had the ability to understand the minds of many southern white males and their fear of change. Yet simultaneously, he was not tone deaf to the plight of African Americans. But now, as the people quietly moved past, all walks and all races, placing their attention on the vacant face of Florida's 31st governor. All that promise seemed to crumble. Though Dan McCarty was robbed of his proper place in state history, this moment in time is still quite profound. As hindsight would reveal, this was a tipping point for the state. It was the moment when everything changed. The decades of commercial expansion, the golden age of the Florida legislature, the governorships of Askew, Graham, and of course, Collins, all stem from this one moment in time, the denied potential of this one man. What is so shocking is not that his death was a surprising catalyst for change, but that it could so easily have gone the other way for Florida, and it didn't. The man elected by a healthy mandate from the citizens of Florida who were seeking progress and change was now dead. The old order was not only safe from his ideals, it had actually inherited his office thanks to an outdated state constitution. Yet the establishment was not able to make the people forget and was soon placed on a gradual extinction of its own. The populism and moderate ideals of McCarty seemed to transcend him, moving and adapting on their own to this very day. Ultimately, this rewarded his next elected successor while simultaneously finishing off his appointed replacement and making him little more than
a footnote to his own passing. Just 50 years earlier, the first McCartys immigrated to this state. The notion that one of their descendants could, in such short order, become Speaker of the Legislature and then Governor must have seemed impossible to most people, but not the McCartys. They were talented, determined, able, and forward-thinking people. They had a restless streak to prove themselves and seemed brilliant in the industry of agriculture and commerce. The McCarty family soon became one of the most influential to reside in the state of Florida, producing not only a governor, but legions of lawyers, business leaders, a state representative, a state senator, president of the bar, and several councilmen. They introduced the concept of condos on the beach and were pioneers in the state's citrus, pineapple, and cattle industries. They were all naturally attractive, naturally athletic, and habitually successful. Settling and then helping to build Fort Pierce, they seemed to possess all the great qualities that made a traditional Floridian. When it came time for them to marry and start a family, the McCartys were as prolific and as successful in that as they were in business. The governor's grandfather, C.T. McCarty, built a magnificent three-story beach house, which soon became the family's base of operations. The family was now prosperous, influential, and contented. But it seemed there was a payment for all of this great success and happiness. None of the McCartys seemed to live particularly long. C.T. McCarty was gunned down by a friend, and the governor's own father died at just 42 from heart disease. The death of his father changed Dan McCarty, and with his mother's ambitious prodding, he set about to become her right-hand man in the agricultural business, as well as a father figure to his other younger siblings. Much, perhaps too much, was expected of Dan McCarty, but he always succeeded. He always excelled. By the time of his high school graduation and entrance at UF, he had a reputation as being a man in a hurry, as someone who was going places, destined to put Fort Pierce on the map. He was an above average student, yet it was in campus life where he made his mark. From the onset, he was perceived as a campus leader, as somebody who you could rely on. If you were in trouble or needed to know your way around the place, Dan McCarty was usually the first person you tried to find. He was warm, outgoing, and caring. Once when a fellow student climbed a rooftop and announced that he was going to commit suicide, it was Dan McCarty who went on the rooftop and after several hours convinced the troubled young man to come down. Leadership came very naturally to him and after his graduation, he returned to Fort Pierce when he soon became one of the most active civic leaders the city had ever seen. There was hardly a club that Dan McCarty didn't take part in. He was an elk, a mason, a woodsman, a shriner, and a member of the local rotary. He was a moose and a member of both the Chamber of Commerce and the Junior Chamber of Commerce. A profoundly religious man, he was a warden at the St. Andrew's Episcopal Church. Then, only in his 20s, when a seat became vacant in the Florida House of Representatives, he filed to run. His family's good name, as well as his civic activism, dissuaded anyone else from entering the race. He would be elected three times, never once with an opponent. By the time of his final session, he was elected the Speaker of the Florida House. Proving to be one of the ablest and most popular, he earned the nickname, the Boy Speaker. There was talk about him entering a race for the State Senate, but the country's involvement in World War II put an end to that ambition. McCarty would fight in North Africa and then Sicily. 
in 1945, he would be presented with the Bronze Star for bravery. He would eventually be elevated to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and be awarded a Purple Heart for an injury he sustained during the Allied invasion of the south of France. Once the war ended, Colonel McCarty, now married and starting a family, when he returned home, he served for two years on the state's Citizens Tax Committee. While some party leaders were trying to get him to run for the state Senate, the 1948 gubernatorial campaign was up and running, and Dan McCarty was determined to win his party's nomination. Unlike many past governors, Dan McCarty did not speak with a southern accent, but rather a non-regional, fairly neutral speaking voice. While on the stump, he put away the historically melodramatic orations of past gubernatorial candidates, and instead decided to have a subtle, down-to-earth, and highly approachable form of delivery. The crowds ate it up. Wherever he went, he was proclaimed as the great new face of Florida. At just 35 years old, the former House Speaker was the third man to enter the race. Both the State Attorney General and the Superintendent of Education were already running. Both men lacked Dan McCarty's spark and insightful message, and he seemed the early frontrunner. It was only when State Senator Fuller Warren announced his candidacy that the race became competitive. The great columnist and historian Alan Morris declared that the race was a contest between one army colonel, McCarty, and one naval officer, Warren. Oddly enough, during his travels from Sicily to mainland Italy, it was on an army supply ship that Dan McCarty was treated to lengthy conversations and stories by gunnery crew commander, Lieutenant Fuller Warren. Fuller proved to be everything that Dan McCarty wasn't. While McCarty presented a 15-point plan, carefully outlining his agenda, Fuller Warren was dramatic, melodramatic, some would say, and made it all about flashy appearances and even campaigning full-time across the state on an airplane. It would prove to be the most expensive gubernatorial election at that time, and Fuller Warren stunned the state by winning handily. It would be the first and only political defeat of Dan McCarty's life, and it stung bitterly. He was determined to try again in 1952. Fuller Warren, for his part, might have won the governorship, but it came at a very heavy price. becomes the 30th governor of Florida. And in front of the state capitol in Tallahassee, he arrives for the impressive inaugural ceremony. A huge crowd is on hand, and the audience includes high members of the state and federal governors. The new governor, succeeding outgoing Millard Caldwell, takes a seat next to his sister, Miss Alma Warren, who will act as Florida's first lady. He was attractive and good-natured, and he drew many into his circle. Sadly, some of them were unsavory. And by the time that he had entered the governorship, he found himself powerless, having exhausted the public's goodwill because he had heavily mortgaged the office. Dan McCarty started campaigning for governor in 1947 and never really stopped. Following the defeat in 1948, he simply refused to stop making speeches. He was the front runner to the current governor. And as Fuller Warren became embattled in the position, Dan McCarty gradually was able to enhance his popularity, serving as something akin to a shadow governor. He would tour the state nonstop, turning up at countless gatherings and events. He made new signs based on the old 1948 slogan of, let's double down our drive for Dan, and words won't win, vote Dan in. Ties and buttons were made with the slogan. Former and current House members were heavily lobbied, and a modern, 
Command Center was set up at Fort Pierce. In just four years, the population of South Florida had exploded, and many of them were attracted to Dan McCarty's progressive agenda. This new body of support, along with his already established base, would make him unbeatable in 1952, and in fact, he would win a stunning election to capture the nomination. In January, the family car was packed, and Florida's new first family drove themselves to their new elevated status with about as much pomp as a typical family on their way to a vacation at a timeshare. The car packed, stuffed in fact, with suitcases, toys, and other beloved items from home. With the governor-elect at the wheel, the McCarty family was on its way to Tallahassee. Inauguration Day 1953 was a glorious, sunny winter morning. Crowds flocked on the western end of the Capitol to watch Dan McCarty be sworn in as governor. The newspaper accounts were filled with delightful anecdotes of Florida's new first family, about how the governor couldn't find his tie pit and friend Leroy Collins lent him his own, about how the first daughter was caught by the governor sticking her tongue out during the parade, about how the McCarty boys were going around collecting the flashbulbs from reporters, how Dan McCarty refused to stand up when Dixie was played, and at how thrilled Fuller Warren was to be leaving the dilapidated governor's mansion that he had long criticized. It wouldn't take long for the McCartys to make the mansion their own. When a reporter asked his older son, Dan, how he liked the mansion, he replied that he enjoyed it. There were plenty of places for him to hide. Younger son, Tom, enjoyed sneaking up on people, and the first daughter quickly defaced all of the columns outside on the portico with countless chalk drawings. But right away it seemed apparent that the governor was in ailing health. He was pushing himself too hard. He was smoking more. He was skipping meals. He was having fiery sessions with the Senate President, Charlie Johns. And most of the state capitol officials warned that he shouldn't work as hard, that he was quickly burning himself out. The archives in Tallahassee are filled with his memorandum. His answered correspondence in one month was the equivalent of Fuller Warren six or seven. And while his predecessor was regarded as something of a show horse, it was very obvious right from the get-go that Dan McCarty was a tireless workhorse. So it wasn't at all surprising when in February he would be hospitalized. What was surprising was the diagnosis of a heart attack. His staff would take up most of the day-to-day -day operations of the executive office, yet memorandum and correspondence were still being sent to his hospital room, and reporters took photographs of him still hard at work at his Tallahassee Memorial Hospital bed. Eventually, he was discharged and allowed to return home to the governor's mansion. Again, photographs were taken, exiting the governor's limousine, dressed in a robe and pajamas. His forced smile and upbeat exterior hid a grim reality that he was a sick man. It was determined that he was not well enough to return back to the office and that he shouldn't give his annual State of the State address. That would be left to the Secretary of State, Gray, to do the honor with his eldest son and the First Lady in attendance. The first line of the speech addressing that the people of Florida now had unrefutable evidence that their governor, in fact, had a heart. Refusing to move his bedroom into the air-conditioned first-floor governor's office, he would wear himself out 
climbing to his bedroom each and every day. Aides recalled that they would hear him wheezing and that his complexion was poor. For months, he would rest upstairs, watching the traffic of people entering and leaving the street below. He would receive frequent visits from his next-door neighbor and friend, Leroy Collins. And he would take up reading, including one book on positive thinking. He would linger in and out of poor health for several weeks. Eventually, the First Lady joked that the mansion had become a sick ship. The children had chicken pox. She fell. Her mother was visiting with a fracture, and the governor was still recovering from his heart attack. Eventually, he would return to the office, but his workload was severely altered. The correspondence was now being answered by staff, who indicated that the governor was still recovering and couldn't answer for himself. There was gossip around the Capitol that Charlie Johns, due to the Constitution, the next in succession, was attempting to place himself as acting governor until Dan McCarty was fit enough to attend the matters of state daily. To put an end to such rumors, the governor forced himself to come to work multiple times a week. By the summer of 1953, he seemed well enough and was out of danger. He started taking back up his rigorous daily schedule and holding office hours with people of the public. But he was still not back to his old self. During a meeting with many volunteers of his campaign, they were shocked by the change. He had more gray in his hair. He was exceedingly thin. His color was still off, and he seemed tired. Not long after, the enthusiastic young governor attended a Shriners parade. He didn't feel well that day, and the weather was cold and rainy. Yet he was the guest of honor and refused to cancel. In the days that followed, he started complaining that he was unwell, and he developed a cold, which would then develop to pneumonia. Friends became a permanent fixture at Tallahassee Memorial. They would come in droves to pray out in the lobby. One day, the governor's two brothers took young Dan to see his father. Traveling along a back stairwell, they came to his bedside, and there, dispassionately, the governor informed his eldest son that he would now have to be man of the house. His condition was fatal. His body was just not strong enough. He was placed in an oxygen tent, and a heart specialist was on his way from Louisiana. At times, he was delirious, or just unconscious. Yet to the shock of everybody, he then began to rally. He started sitting up and taking liquids, yet it was not to last. Staying in a nearby hospital room, the first lady was woken up in the night to be informed that the governor was now dying. They spoke with one another for some time, casually, and then he closed his eyes and didn't wake up. Daniel McCarty, Florida's 31st governor, was dead of pneumonia. The state had known for some time that the governor was in danger, but the news of his passing was felt like an earthquake. The majority was united against reapportionment, so they simply continued with business as usual. They met on the Osceola River at lobbyist Rayburn Horn's fish camp and played poker and drank whiskey. They lived and plotted together during sessions at the Cherokee Hotel, the Floridan, and later at the Duval. They still had the votes, but they were coming under increasing criticism, both from Governor Collins and from newspapermen like Tampa Tribune editor Jim Clendenin. It was Clendenin who gave the pork chop gang its name. In denouncing the tactics of these <coughs> senators who uh, refused to <coughs> abide by the Constitution, I said they put pork over principle. And uh, I kind of like that illusion. Uh, <laughs> uh, so in a later editorial, I said, uh, 
They uh, referred them as the pork chop gang because most of them were from rural, rural areas and uh, pork chop seemed to be appropriate term uh, for that uh, area and for, and for their uh, affinity for pork. Pork as in pork barrel political projects or bringing home the bacon. Those in power brought state money and state projects back to their districts. Jobs with the state went to their families and their friends. I never expected it to catch on as it did. It was picked up by other newspapers and wire services and other politicians. And pretty soon even the pork choppers were refer <laughs> referring to themselves as pork choppers. <laughs> Johns, a former train conductor and insurance salesman from Stark, Florida, let it be known right from the get-go that he was governor, not acting governor. He refused to give up the state senate presidency and began to remove McCarty appointees. He moved his family into the governor's mansion and wasted no time in moving the McCartys out of the executive suite. The state was flabbergasted by this slow-talking southern gentleman who was rolling back all of McCarty's changes. He had his portrait placed on all road maps and continued to draw a salary from both the state senate and the executive branch. A chief member of the rural conservative pork chop gang, he was a confirmed and open racist. Whenever he had opponents to his senate seat, he would almost always imply that the opponents were beating their wives. He thought communists and homosexuals were everywhere, and he would go on making a lasting, notorious name for himself due to the committee that bears his name that rooted out homosexuals and communists in the school system. He immediately announced that he would seek the remainder of McCarty's term in a special election that was to take place the following year. It was apparent that he would be challenged in the primary by one from the Dan McCarty camp. The only question was, by who? Many thought it would be his younger brother, John McCarty, while others longed for it to be friend and state senator, Leroy Collins. After much infighting and backroom mudslinging, it looked as though both men would be running against John, and the primary was going to get ugly. It was only after Dan McCarty's widow both privately and publicly endorsed Leroy Collins that the race narrowed down to just two men. Brother John left the race, fantastically bitter. The special election of 1954 was a powerball barnstorming free-for-all extravaganza, a titanic struggle between the left and the right. Both men despised one another, carrying over the animosity of McCarty and Johns. Oddly though, they were both next door neighbors and their children loved one another forming lasting relationships and were often seen playing with one another. It was the first gubernatorial election to be done on television. Both men had starkly different opinions and views, and often the specter of Dan McCarty was present everywhere. You've heard about the 1960 television debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon, but Florida had its own television debate six years earlier during the 1954 governor's campaign. It pitted acting governor Charlie Johns against state senator Leroy Collins. In our historical segment tonight, Governor Collins recalls that debate, which many considered a turning point in the campaign. We had a, 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 a very tough campaign. Uh, Johns had the advantage of incumbency. And uh, I made it very clear that I wanted to carry forward the McCarty program and my own program that would uh, benefit the state. And so and it, it included uh, my own program, included uh, a reapportionment of representation in the legislature, which was sorely needed, uh, and other rather controversial uh, matters. Uh, I tried to get Governor Johns to debate, and he refused to debate. And, uh, but just a short time before the election, this was in the second primary now, he had run ahead of me in the first primary, but he and I were in a runoff election. 
and it was just before that runoff election that we had this uh, debate. He agreed that he would uh, meet with me in a debate, so one was set up on television down in Miami. And a rather strange thing happened. Uh, the Miami Herald, first edition of the paper, is on the streets there about 8 o'clock the evening before. And so that evening, we were going over to the uh, television station a little after 8. I think the program was set for 8.30. And I got a telephone call, an urgent call from some unknown friend. And he told me to be sure to look at the Miami Herald up the next morning. It was already on, on the streets being sold. And I'd find something very interesting in it. And so I did. And there it was, a full page advertisement uh, by the opposition uh, that was premised upon the proposition that the debate had already been held and that I had been badly beaten in the debate and that Johns had been very successful and that I had tucked my tail between my legs and had left town and all this kind of thing. So I took that newspaper with me to the uh, state radio television station and as the moderator was just starting the program before he could uh, introduce us uh, to begin the debate, I asked him to let me talk, have a statement to make uh, and I didn't give him time to think whether I should be allowed to do that or not. I just pulled up that newspaper and I said, I want that camera to come up here and take a, and see a picture of this advertisement. We haven't had one word of this debate, and yet here our opposition is presuming that it's all over and that they have won and that we have lost. And this is the kind of, of shenanigans and, and political uh, maneuverings that, that uh, we're fighting against in this campaign. And uh, I, I think this is rude and crude and is not the kind of thing that uh, should characterize Florida politics. And I just want to say so before any word is said in the debate. Good evening, everybody. This is Ralph Rennick welcoming you to another edition of What's the Story? Florida, as you know, is approaching the climax of a turbulent political drama. Two men are campaigning for votes in a May 25th runoff election, which will decide who will serve the last two years of the unexpired term of the late governor, Dan McCarty. Ralph, Mr. Rennie, could I make a statement uh, before the uh, program starts here, rather preliminary to it? An opening statement, Senator? Well, I'd just like to comment on the, 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 the meeting and well, express my appreciation for the fact can... that the... Get off and make everybody happy at the very beginning. Governor, uh, if the senator makes an opening statement and you make one, will that be acceptable? Uh, anything. Opening statement by each candidate. We'll start with Senator Cobb. Well, I just wanted to express my uh, appreciation of the fact that the acting governor has finally agreed to participate in a joint meeting of this kind. I regret that he was unwilling to participate in many office for meetings uh, in the first primary when Mr. Odom was also a candidate. I've been reading the last few days uh, some of the rather vicious, scurrilous advertising that's been taking place in the Miami Herald here in regard to this approaching meeting. And I was amazed when I came into the studio tonight out on the streets to pick up a copy of tomorrow morning's Miami Herald to find that the meeting had already been held. I, I just wanted to ask the acting governor something about this. Now, here's a copy of tomorrow morning's Herald. And it's an official advertisement uh, by acting Governor Johns. And he says, proof that truth is mightier than the syrupy mouthings. Governor Johns, direct talk to the people of Dade wins wide support. Now, this is in the morning's paper, not this morning. Well, Senator Collins, wherever you are, we told you what would happen. You asked for it on television last night, and you got it. You didn't look so good, Senator, did you? Neither did your record when it was put up against that of Governor Johns, did it? Governor Johns would much rather have left you to your own devices and let the public discuss, discover for itself exactly what you are. But you wanted to get on television. Well, you got your wish, didn't you? We hope you are satisfied now, Senator. And that's the sort of advertising that's been prepared and running a local paper two hours before the meeting is held, and I find that I'm already convicted. All right, uh, Senator Collins, acting Governor John. I'd have anything to do with 
Any advertisement, I, I, not to start with, I mean, I didn't know anything about any advertisement that's going to be put in the paper because that's not Charlie John's, and the citizens of Florida know it's not Charlie John's. But I've carried on a good, clean, decent pain, and Leroy knows it. And I want to say again that I've heard Leroy say that in his heart he felt like he could make the citizens of Florida a good governor. Well, when I was sworn in as acting governor of this state... Governor, your time is up. We'll get back in a, in a moment. Uh... The, the effect of it was quite electric, and uh, the people... We had a statewide radio hookup, and a couple of other television stations, I think, were hooked up. But that was in the beginning days of television. Yeah. And, uh, but I think that our real victory move started right there that night. And it was all downhill from that point. And all, uh, I think, the other way for him from that point. The debate made Leroy Collins, and he would go on to win the primary and then the general election easily. He would graciously dedicate his inaugural address to his fallen friend and wear the same tie pin that his friend had worn two years earlier. The Johns Collins transition was probably one of the most tumultuous in the history of the Sunshine State, and John's personal animosity towards his successor would carry on all throughout Leroy Collins's term and beyond. Leroy Collins always felt that he was serving a governorship for two men, and in the end, he would leave office having been the kind of governor and leader that Daniel McCarty had always wanted to be, and that his supporters dreamed he could be. The gallery of governors outside of the governor's executive office in the Capitol building has usually about seven or eight former governor's portraits. Whenever the latest governor's portrait arrives, one of the portraits is moved out of rotation and placed in storage. Such was the case in the early 90s when Buddy McKay's and Lawton Child's portraits had entered the gallery. Ferris Bryant, the governor who had served in the early 1960s, had his portrait taken down, and so did Leroy Collins. But when current governor Jeb Bush, a noted admirer of Collins, saw this, he ordered that the portrait be returned to the gallery. Only, instead of being in rotation, it was given a separate location, out of the rotation. This simple act was highly significant. It made Collins something above the normal Florida governor, and helped establish his reputation as the Floridian of the 20th century. Meanwhile, the portraits of Dan McCarty and Charlie Johns have long been in storage. In the 2000s, following the death of Mary Call Collins, the wife of Leroy Collins, their home, the historic grove in Tallahassee, was completely renovated. It now serves as a museum a shrine dedicated to the life and political career of Collins. In a moment of tragic happenstance and bizarre irony, in Fort Pierce, the homestead of Dan McCarty, at the same time that the grove was being opened, was destroyed by developers. Bricks and mortar, official portraits, what did they signify? Absolutely nothing. In the final analysis, portraits, structures, even statues, the kind of bric-a-brac that might inspire nostalgia for a little while, are a pretty poor substitute for representing the life of a person. But what is far more measurable and important is the ideals that the person had. 
the public good that they incited, and the morals that govern their every act. In the case of Leroy Collins and Dan McCarty, their impact is felt even to this day. Perhaps no two friends have ever done more to change the directory of the Sunshine State. Who is Dan McCarty? Who really knows? Almost everyone that knew him is gone now. He left no oral histories. There's no audio recording of him. He seems to remain an elusive enigma. But sometimes when we don't have a whole, we're left with the sum of its parts. And this much we know. He was a citizen, a soldier, a loving father, a devoted husband, a great legislator, and a true Floridian. And in the end, what else is there?